Community Cats podcast. Ready? Let's go. Welcome to the Community Cats podcast. I am your host, Stacey LeBaron. I have been involved helping homeless cats for over 20 years with the Merrimack River Feline Rescue Society. The goal of this podcast is to expose you to amazing people who are improving the lives of cats. I hope these interviews will help you learn how you can turn your passion for cats into action. And today we're speaking with Katie Lisnick, who is the Director of Cat Protection and Policy and Companion Animals for the Humane Society of the United States. Many of you know Katie. We've had her on the show several times, and we love playing this game called Policy Jeopardy. So, Katie, welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm so happy to be back. So, would you be willing to share with us any new news that you might have on things that have already happened? And then also you're talking about things gearing up for 2018. But I do see some news about what's going on in New Hampshire. Want to share that? Sure. Some really good news out of New Hampshire. It was a little challenging. Uh, we had some language that got inserted into the budget, which they passed this year, that would actually allow, it, it changed a provision that was preventing shelters and rescues from being able to transfer or adopt out cats with uh, FIV or FELV. So as you know, most of your listeners know, in, in almost every single other state, shelters can adopt out those cats. You know, the, the disease transmission rates are much less than previously thought. There's some really good research showing these cats can live healthy lives for a long time. So New Hampshire was really out of step with the rest of the country, and shelters there weren't able to do anything with these cats. They either had to euthanize them or just kind of provide a sanctuary for them. So we worked with the State Department of Agriculture and the, the state veterinarian. He agreed. He, you know, he said the, the disease regulations that were causing this problem, it wasn't his intent to be, you know, preventing these cats from going home. So he worked with us to get the language in. The budget had challenges. And so it kind of, the language got caught up in, in budgetary discussions and, and all kinds of rigmarole surrounding that. But ultimately, it did pass, uh, and the governor signed it. And so now New Hampshire is um, allowing those cats to get out into homes or to be transferred to other organizations like a, you know, like an FIV specific cat rescue or something like that. So that was really, really good news. We were so excited. It's been a long time coming, and the shelters were so thankful that now they don't have to just hold on to those cats. They can provide them better outcomes. That's fantastic. So they are able to adopt them out. They are, yes. That's great. That's great. So I'm going to spin the wheel and choose another state. I am going to choose Louisiana. Louisiana. Okay. Well, as we as we all know, what when we're being interviewed right now with Hurricane Harvey happening, and, and we'll see how long it takes for that to get cleaned up, it might put a little bit of a, a wrench into 2018 planning. But the thought is right now, Louisiana would like to pursue some community cat changes in their state statutes for the 2018 session. So we don't have exact language. We don't have exact info on what's going to be included. But what we're seeing is outdated language in a lot of states that were, you know, were drafted well before TNR was a thing. So definitions like the, you know, the definition of owner or the definition of abandonment or how abandonment is talked about in state statute can be kind of restrictive or preventative to have to having TNR happen. So what we try to do is go in, take a look at current statute and figure out where the where the barriers are that are preventing groups from doing really robust TNR and try to get those changed. So things like perhaps inserting a definition for community cat caregiver or modifying the abandonment statute to, you know, to say that TNR is not abandonment. And it can be done in multiple different ways. And we make it very specific to, you know, the state language. But that's the sort of thing we're looking for for Louisiana is to figure out the best approach there. And this past year, they actually had a bill that would have um, exempted or included a provision that for the stray hold period that unowned cats didn't necessarily have to abide by that 
if there was a, a live outcome option for them. So a straight hold was in effect if euthanasia was going to be the option. But if the cat could go back out into the field through a return to field program or a TNR program, they didn't have to wait for the full straight hold before that could happen. So what we see typically in shelters that are holding stray cats for that long and then doing TNR is they'll often end up getting sick because they're stressed out, they're in proximity, close proximity to other cats that may be sick, and then you end up having to hold the cats even longer to provide some treatment. And it's it's stressful for them, especially the truly feral ones. So having that sort of bifurcated hold is a, a really good thing. So that will be something we're also looking at for Louisiana. Hmm, very interesting. What's going on up in Alaska? In Alaska, yeah, so this will actually be very timely. Um, I think the 27th is the last day that comments, uh, 27th of October is the last day that comments can go in. And what it is is a, a rule change through the State Department of Wildlife. Right now, there's a regulation on the books that says that any cat and any dog and a whole, whole, a whole list of other animals cannot be released back into nature or into the wild. And cats are on that list. So it becomes a de facto ban on doing TNR. So what um, is happening is an advocate up there has put in a petition to get that changed. And it's a very specific change. It's not exempting all cats. It's only exempting ear-tipped, sterilized community cats. So, you know, it's a, you know, you're not just putting cats out willy-nilly. It's not opening it up to abandonment. You know, it's not providing cover of, of anyone who wants to just release a cat. It's really only very specifically targeted to those doing TNR that they can put the cats back into the colonies where they live. So that will be really interesting to see what happens. Alaska is a, a very challenging state. It's very remote. There's not a lot of groups up there that are doing TNR right now, although there are some. The climate makes it extra challenging and, you know, just sort of the, the wildlife attitudes. It'll be really interesting to see how this rule change moves forward and, and if it does or if it doesn't. Is there a, a big problem or a lot of population in Alaska for community cats? I mean, I would think obviously the location, um, the environment would kind of bring the numbers down. Also, there's a lot of predators, too. Exactly. So you know, typically what we see is, is very common in, in other colder states as well as the cats live in proximity to people. So the cats are, you know, there are colonies in Anchorage and there are colonies in Juneau. You know, there are colonies in the cities where they're able to find food. They've, they've got some shelter. People are feeding them. Out in the real remote areas of Alaska, no, you're not seeing cats running around. They're, you know, <laughs> other things are taking care of them there. So what we're really talking about and why we feel this is a, a really good proposal to consider is, you know, we're not talking about these remote, far-flung areas where cats may be predating upon wildlife or causing wildlife issues and environmental concerns. These cats are living in close proximity to people. So we need to be looking at it through a different lens. What's going on in Kansas? Kansas. I stuck Kansas on the list uh, for our little game because right now, after New Hampshire passed their law, Kansas is now the only state that does not allow FIV and FELV cats to be adopted out. So we feel that they, you know, <laughs> they're, they're out on a limb right now, uh, and they're the last state that needs to fall in order to make sure it nationally these cats are able to go into loving homes. So this one has proven a little challenging. Uh, Kansas is also not the easiest state to work in. The rule, it would have to be a rule change, not a statute change. And the Department of Agriculture has been, you know, they've been willing to work with us, but things just keep getting in the way. Something else happens that's higher priority. Another rule change pops up that, that takes their attention away. So it's just been a, a long slog. And our state director, Midge, out there has been wonderful working with them. But we're hopeful that 2018 will be the year that we finally get that rule change passed. And we finally have all of the states in the country on board um, with getting these cats into homes. So you mentioned uh, Midge, state director. So as we discover things in our communities that we're concerned about, 
we should be contacting our individual state directors? That would be wonderful. Yes. Yeah. So they are, you know, between me and them, you know, they're the direct funnel, letting me know what's going on in their state with regards to cats. So if you are in, you know, in your community, you're, you're seeing things, you're wondering, hey, why can't we change this? You know, I've got an ordinance I want to work on. What about this state law that says that TNR might be abandonment? Start talking with them because they're going to know what the political climate is in your state and whether or not a bill like that really has much of a chance, but also can just start laying the groundwork. Most legislation, especially at the state level, it takes several years to get something passed. There's always something that comes up. You want to spend at least a year doing really good research and planning out your effort, getting your coalition together, and really doing your good groundwork before you launch your effort. So it it is a long-term process, but the state directors are going to be able to walk you through all of the points that you need to consider, all of the questions, all of the issues that might arise. And the easiest way to reach out to them is actually just typing the name of your state, And then it's at humanesociety.org. So if you don't know them, you don't know their name, just type in the name of your state at humanesociety.org and it'll get right to them. PopCats, the celebration of cats meet pop culture, will make its electrifying debut in Miami Saturday, October 28th, 2017 at the Miami Airport Convention Center. The curated show will feature a ridiculously adorable cat lounge, visual artists, inspiring speakers, art installations, and the makers of the most innovative products of the cat universe. PopCat's core mission is to raise awareness about cat welfare efforts by crafting an experience that mixes entertainment with advocacy. A portion of proceeds will benefit the Cat Network, a cat-centric not-for-profit organization with over 20 years of service in South Florida. The convention will welcome an invasion of cat lovers, curious spectators, and pop culture fans to a scene flooded with music and immersive art installations specifically designed to ignite shareable memories. The exhibition floor will also grant visitors the unique opportunity to meet national and international talent that have grasped the fascination of the internet community. Highlights amongst the speakers are fervent rescuer Tumblr's meme librarian Amanda Brennan, Lorenzo the Cat photographer Joanne Biondi, and Shark Tank presenter and Apollo's Peak Pet Beverages founder, Brandon Zavala. A giant bubble cat lounge will also be a can't-miss feature at PopCats, where attendees will be able to interact freely with an irresistible herd of adoptable cats brought by the Cat Network. For more information and tickets, please go to www.popcatsshow.com. Hey, everyone. We have another great webinar with Hannah Shaw, the Kitten Lady, coming on October 21st at 11 a.m. Eastern Time. Attending this webinar, you will learn everything you need to know about saving kittens' lives. She'll be talking all about kittens and bottle babies. This event will cover the ins and outs of kittens, including an overview of issues impacting cats and kittens, how to set up your home, manage your time, and make fostering fun. We'll also cover how to properly feed, clean, and provide basic medical care to a kitten, as well as how to get involved in your local community. To sign up for this free webinar, go to www.communitycatspodcast.com. I hope to see you there. It's on October 21st at 11 a.m. Eastern Time. Join us and have fun. What's going on in Wisconsin? Wisconsin is similar to Louisiana right now. This past year, there was kind of a a media brouhaha about uh, a man who was very vocal about wanting to see all feral cats eradicated and posting some photos of, of cats he had trapped and talking about trapping on his land and other people's land. And, and some of it was a little confusing as to what he was actually doing and whether or not the photos were actually real, but it uncovered you know, a conversation and and sort of riled up some of the animal welfare groups in the state, and rightly so, to really take a look at Wisconsin statutes to see what should be improved to prevent something like that. So what we, we normally will try to look at is, you know, how are cats defined? Sometimes you'll see cats defined as domestic, uh, all cats as domestic, which is what we, we want to see and all cats covered under the cruelty code. But in some states, you actually see a little bit of a a bifurcation where you'll have feral cats defined differently from house cats. 
or from domestic cats. And so you're almost creating two distinct populations, which they're, they're really not. They're all the same species. They just have different levels of sociability. So looking at things like that, taking a look at actually the, you know, like the trapping language and the wildlife codes to make sure there's nothing in there that could, you know, be extended to cats running around. So it'll be an analysis of Wisconsin law to figure out what changes need to be made so we can head off things like that, that appeared in the media this year. Interesting. What one person can do, huh? It, it, it's absolutely fascinating. Yeah, it just kind of uncovers something that maybe just people weren't thinking about or, you know, just raises those couple of questions in people's mind. And, you know, and then it can take on a life of its own. Sort of the legislative vulnerabilities that are out there. Mm-hmm, absolutely. What's going on in New Jersey? New Jersey, New Jersey has some amazing forward progress on cats, and and they're a very progressive state on cat issues. They've had a lot of coalition work amongst the the animal welfare groups and wildlife groups talking about how to best deal with outdoor cats humanely. They've had numerous ordinances recently in the past year. I'd say they've, they've probably had at least a dozen ordinances improved both at the county and at the municipal level for community cats. So putting in language, allowing TNR, putting in, you know, various definitions, clarifying the abandonment language, and really, um, kind of trying to, you know, to knock out the various parts of the state so that we're actually having local ordinances all speaking the same language and allowing the same things. So what we want to do is then start mirroring what we're seeing as the growing trend in the ordinances into state law so that everything's consistent. And some of this can end up being a little dry and boring because you're going back and, and it's not particularly exciting reading state statutes for the most part. It can be a little dry, but making sure that there's nothing in state statute that's going to, you know, disallow what's going on in the ordinances and just making sure that definitions are consistent and and that the state is as broad as possible. You can always have more narrow definitions and more narrow regulations at the local level, but you want the state to be as broad and as permissive as possible so that the the ordinances can kind of be a little patchwork with what works best for that specific community. That sounds like a lot of work. It's an in, it's very interesting. And New Jersey is a, an interesting state because they've got almost a year-round session. Bills can go on for a long, long time and they'll sit you know, they'll sit in committee for months on end with no activity, and then all of a sudden there'll be a little flurry of activity. So you have to really be on top of, of what's coming up. And also, you know, being able to communicate some of these changes to legislators can be challenging because it's not intuitive. It's not, you know, an easy bill that, you know, says, we're going to ban gestation crates for, you know, for pigs on, on factory farms. It's not a real tangible, you can't do this anymore, or we're going to ban this, or we're going to add this. It's uh, it's a much more technical bill that we start doing on these cat issues. So trying to package it in a, a media-friendly way, a legislator-friendly way, um, and an advocate-friendly way so that everyone kind of is saying the same things, like this bill will do this, this bill will do that. Everybody has to be on board. And so, as I mentioned previously, it, it takes a while to get this up to speed, to really be ready to launch your legislative effort. And the state directors are going to be your best point of contact to really walk you through that if you're looking to do something similar in your state. So you mentioned a couple of states, or actually four states, North Carolina, Kentucky, Idaho, and Hawaii, as possible states that are going to be introducing some funding for spay-neuter? Yeah, spay-neuter funding is a major component, obviously, of our community cat work. So, you know, just allowing TNR is is great, but if you don't have the spay-neuter capacity in your area or, you know, the funding coming in to actually make that work, you know, you're not going to be able to do what you could ultimately do if you had that financial support. So we really view getting um, really robust spay-neuter funding in every state as a priority. So right now, there's really a patchwork. Um, about half the states have pretty good spay-neuter programs at the state level. So that's funding through things like a, a tax checkoff or a license plate or in a couple of states, um, actually funding from pet food surcharges, which is a 
uh, a surcharge that goes on top of pet food registration fees that the manufacturers pay. So right now, Maine and Maryland have that. Maryland brings in, you know, over a million dollars for their spay neuter fund every year through that um, pet food um, surcharge. And the cost gets passed on to the consumer. You know, we calculated it out. It, it ended up being something like 50 cents per household per year that buys pet food. But when you start <laughs> adding up all of the households that buy pet food and how much pet food they buy, you know, it, it really goes a long way and can really fund a, a very effective spay-neuter program. So we're looking to mirror that sort of program in other states. And I know specifically in, Ohio, in uh, Idaho, they're looking to do a license plate, a pet-friendly license plate that would fund spay-neuter. In Kentucky, we're looking to do kind of a, a task force to talk about these issues. They're a little bit further behind, not quite ready to launch into something specific, but they need some time and some, uh, some structure to get together and figure out what's going to be the best path forward for Kentucky to improve. They already have a little spay-neuter program, but they need to really expand it and make it more effective. And North Carolina and Hawaii North Carolina would also be modifying theirs, improving theirs. Hawaii would be starting from scratch. They have absolutely nothing right now at the state level for spay-neuter funding. So we're going to talk about perhaps a license plate or a pet food surcharge or something along those lines. And interestingly, in a, a handful of states, about, well, let's say about half the states that have a spay-neuter program the way they're written or the rules that have been drafted around them don't allow the money to be used for TNR or community cats. It'll only be allowed for owned cats, you know, like um, pets belonging to low income families. So that's another component that we try to work on is to, you know, not only make sure that there is a, a good, well-funded spay-neuter program, but then also that that money can be used for TNR and unowned cats where appropriate. So there's still plenty of work to be done on the spay-neuter front, and we really consider it to be, you know, just as important as trying to allow TNR and improve community cat regulations um, really all at the same time. It's very interesting. And I Hawaii certainly needs as much funding as they can get, that's for sure. Yes. So I'm going to ask you just a quick thought or your opinions about the importance of really having information about supporting community cap programs, TNR, spay-neuter, having that information on your website. I'll share this in the show notes, but the MSBCA has a very public free-roaming cat statement and um, I think it's great. And uh, I'm thinking that there are a lot of organizations that are still pretty shy about coming out and really declaring their support for return to field, TNR, you know, all of these spay-neuter programs that we have. What are your thoughts on this issue? Yeah, I think it's really important for organizations to be putting out, whether it's a, a position statement or just, you know, a, an informational page. You know, it, it goes towards the overall push towards making sure that non-lethal strategies are the accepted one. So thinking about my work and, and other national organizations, we can point to this, you know, overwhelming number of organizations that are on board with this strategy. And that does hold a lot of weight with policymakers. So, you know, number one, you know, it really helps to, to push the overall front forward on TNR, but, but for your own community, you know, you're, you're on record as supporting, you know, non-lethal strategies, the most humane approach and your, your members, your constituents, your donors, anybody who's looking to see, you know, what you work on, you know, it's clear. So you're not having to get questions. You're not, you know, being blindsided by someone who says, Hey, I wrote you a check last year. I didn't realize you were in favor of TNR. I want my money back or I'm never going to support you again. Your policies, your positions, you're out there front and center and saying, this is what we believe in. This is what we're going to do. And it really helps dispel some of the questions or the rumors, you know, just sort of the community conversations that may be happening when you're not clear about what your preferred strategies are. Yeah, I agree with you 100 percent that we need to really communicate at all times, you know, what our what our focus is and, and where our positions are. And you may, I mean, you know, you 
we find a field <laughs> calls and, and emails from donors you know, on occasion that aren't happy with our TNR position. We try to have a conversation with them and explain why. And some of them will come around to our point of view. Others don't. So, you know, you certainly will experience that. But you'll also experience new people coming to you and saying, oh, wow, I, you know, I never knew you were in favor of this before. I'm so happy that you are. I really want to support your work. And you might be getting specific donors or specific supporters that are just so happy that you are supportive of these strategies. And now you've got even more people to help with your effort. So you may lose a few, but I think you're probably going to gain more than you would ever lose overall. Katie, that's great. If folks are interested in finding out more about your program, how would they reach out to you or to your staff? Sure. So most of our cat information, you can look on humanesociety.org, or you can also look at animalsheltering.org. Uh, those are, are both of our websites. Humanesociety.org is really our public facing one. If you search for outdoor cats, you'll come up with all of our resources there. And then animalsheltering.org is sort of our shelter and rescue and TNR group website. And you'll find there's a whole tab all about protect cats. And that's where all of our uh, cat information is living right now. So tons of good stuff on the websites for you to explore. And then if you have questions or want to reach out or want to get connected with your state director, want to learn more, you can email us at cats at humanesociety.org. That's great. Katie, I want to thank you so much for coming on the show today and playing Policy Jeopardy. Appreciate that very much. And hopefully we'll have you back maybe in early 2018. Oh, wonderful. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. Happy to talk about this. And uh, yeah, I'd love to come back anytime. The Community Cats podcast will soon be a year old with over 200 episodes profiling amazing people who are all making a difference in the lives of community cats. If you would like to support the show but not be a sponsor, feel free to contribute to our efforts by going to www.communitycatspodcast.com and follow the donate link. Help us to continue to provide excellent programming. 